Hi, welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Rafael, and tonight we'll be discussing melancholy. The world is done. I hope you're all doing well. I also hope you're listening to us in the silence of the night, for this topic is deserving of that meditative scene. You know, that time of the night where only a few lights in the distance are lit. You have some work left to do, maybe some homework, maybe you cannot sleep. Or you are hungry even, but you take a minute to contemplate the loneliness of the moment, and maybe even reflect upon your life a little, while you sit looking into the space. Well, we're accompanying you in that moment, with an episode according to the theme. The world is done, and we'll see why. In tonight's episode, taken by the hand of John Donne, and his elegy, The Anatomy of the World, we'll be looking at melancholy during the 17th century and draw some parallels to our time to think a little bit more about how melancholy is inherent to human experience, and see the beauties of the way we differ a little with our past. First, we have to examine the term melancholy. It has fascinated many. It has been discussed along history many times, yet it seems to be a very evasive concept in terms of absolute definition. It rather seems like melancholy is understood by instinct. We know what we mean by melancholic, yet we cannot put it into words concisely. But for tonight, we can try to describe some phenomena around it. Maybe the main issue that describes the experience of melancholy is the sensation of a void. A void which brings upon unhappiness and anxiety, and that we cannot understand as opposed to a tragedy in our lives, like a dead relative, in which we can point out the reason for our suffering, it seems that with melancholy inside us, we do not know where all went wrong. While being sad in relation to a tragedy seems reasonable and normal, melancholy stands out for existing without a known reason, and causing the same malady to the mind and body, also feeling melancholic is rather intermittent and arbitrary, and this condition is despairing. It seems that melancholy belongs to the irrational or the absurd, yet its presence breeds overthinking. It happens as a result of ever searching a reason for the unhappiness and becomes an anxious examination that snowballs into a bigger illness. It breeds tragedy. But also, in an ambivalent way, this profound sadness with no purpose becomes the source of clarity and vision that in conjunction with the artistic sensitivity allows people to create, see and extrapolate what others can't. We can see this phenomena with artists who are associated with depression or similar mental illnesses that are regarded as genius. The way I better understand melancholy is as dissatisfaction with the world. We realize that the world is a miserable place, and the void is coming from the realization that we don't we cannot do anything to profoundly change it, for it has been ever the same. Today we call it depression or anxiety, but that we know that there is something more, that just the mess up chemistry of the brain for us, or humor disbalance to the 17th century. There is just more that we know that causes this illness. Let's take a little journey into the 17th century, which were very turbulent times to say the least. Crisis of religion and faith, the Thirty Years' War, plague, a scientific revolution that is shaking the basic understanding of the world. Take an idea of how horrible the panorama was. The Thirty Years' War which was a very vicious conflict that was fought on continental Europe, devastated it and caused economic crisis at the same time it spread many diseases that even reached into Britain. In that century, the British Revolution happened and the Restoration later, both of which were very vicious conflict too. Major breakthroughs in the science field and observations in astronomy having changed in all conceptions and generating crises of fate. It was not a particularly good time to be alive. Now, melancholy. Ever related to sickness, 
at this time was explored through the theory of humors or humorism, which was still really important to medicine at the beginning of the century. These ideas came from the Greeks from Galen. They thought that the body was made of four fluids that were in equilibrium, and the disequilibrium of these would cause any illness. It was thought that according to your zodiac sign, or the day you were born, the place you were born, and many other factors, your humor constitution was unique and imbalanced by default. That is to say that there were people who were more inclined to be the black bile or the melancholic types. John Donne enters the picture at the beginning of the 17th century. He was a metaphysical poet. Metaphysical poetry is poetry of very violent metaphors and paradoxes, in the sense that they were complex, that there is violence in the movement of meanings. One of his creations was an elegy composed for the deceased daughter of one of his patrons. According to the Norton Anthology of English Literature, Don did not know this girl, who died noticeably young, so he decided to write this poem approaching the ideal of a woman. Rather than just pleasing his patron friend, he took the opportunity to reflect upon the event. Don took away the, Don took away the individual experience of her death and treated it as a major event in the world, in the world that demonstrated its demise. Don took away the individual experience of her death and treated it as a major event in the world that demonstrated its demise. From there, Don takes the opportunity to examine the world and humanity. In the anatomy of the world, Don explores the tragedy of death detaching from the individual experience of it to reach a general reflection over the state of the world. This results in a further reaching insight that still draws parallels to the future and reveals the inherent melancholic state of the world. Now onto the analysis. Let's look at the anatomy of melancholy. We'll be approaching the poem as it progresses, for sake of simplicity. I will call I will quote some lines from the beginning, lines 8 to 12. Open quote. When that queen ended her progress time, and as to her standing house to heaven did climb, where, loath to make the saints attain her long, she, she is now part both of the choir and song. The world in that great earthquake languished. End quote. We can observe that the speaker is starting in a positive manner, elevating her death to a positive transformation and even an event to celebrate. This is no foreign idea to Christianity, but the speaker is expressing this in contrast with the state of the world, a world languished. Notice the way the two, wor two worlds are. Notice the way the two worlds are portrayed. Going to heaven is becoming choir and song, harmony. Furthermore, we can associate this with the harmony of the music of the spheres, the idea of divine perfection in the movement of the celestial bodies. But this in contrast with a world that has earthquakes, a horrific event that shakes the globe and therefore nullifies that harmony, paints the picture of a terrible world that is worth escaping. At the same time, the discourse is shifting focus from her to the world, and the world will be later personified and addressed. For instance, lines 23 and 24, open quote, So thou, sick world, mistakes thyself to be well, when alas, thou art in lethargy. End quote. Here, here, we can observe how the world becomes personified and an addressee. The detachment from the individual experience of the death of a loved one begins. We see that now he's referring to a general depressing state of the world that happens to be causing all individual affection. Thou sick world, and sick the world is indeed. Don continues this idea further on, even making it a conceit that guides the poem meditation on the subject. Take the lines 55 to 60. Open quote. But thou it be too late to succor thee, sick world, ye dead, ye putrefied, since she, thy intrinsic palm and thy preservative, can never be renewed, thou never live. I, since no man can make thee live, will try, 
what we may gain by thy anatomy. End quote. A sick world, a dead world. Look at the images. This is no anatomy. This is an autopsy. The voice expresses that the world is unsavageable, that it is dead with no hope to be saved. Yet the question arises: Why are th why are we here if the world is dead? It does not make sense. Even lines 63 to 66 rose to tackle that paradox. Open quote. Let no man say the world itself being death. This labor lost to have discovered the world infirmities, since there is none. I live to study this dissection, for there is a kind of world remaining still. End quote. As the poem states, anyone living is a witness of a world. So, what is happening? Examining the images will help us solve this conceit. We have a sick and dead being, and the poetic voice is performing an examination of this body. But I suggest we read this anatomy as rather an autopsy, for we have a strong emphasis in the putrid condition of the world. Chedon is calling it an anatomy because the world is not dead nor destroyed, yet it is putrefied. This is a living being that is having an autopsy. It seems paradoxical, but this idea of the putrefied body that cannot die, a living corpse, perfectly embodies the idea Don is looking to convey. That is a strong image that, although difficult to conceive, it is not lost in time. It is a violent metaphor and a violent picture. We exist in a dead body that cannot die. The foundation of our existence is putrid. This conceit brings about many images, doesn't it? Images such as humans inhabiting the earth are maggots in the living corpse that is the world. Think about how problematic it is to live in a place that is putrefied. Think about it literally. Places like buildings built on top of dumpsters or close to contaminated lakes. Don further expands this idea by bringing physicians into the picture. In lines 91 and 92, open quote, there is no health physicians says that we, at best, enjoy, but a neutrality, end quote. And line 95 and 96 state, open quote, we are born ruinous, poor mothers cry, that children come, that children come not right, not otherly, end quote. Being born into a corrupt place will corrupt us, and it is impossible to escape the living corpse. Sickness is inherent, and we are condemned to exist here. We can only aspire to neutrality, to stay normal, never to be truly well. At the same time, Don seems to be suggesting some optimism, not from the state of the world, but from the exercise of meditation of describing the anatomy and transforming it into a poem. This, what we may gain, is framed as a neutral result, not good enough to change the feeling towards this condition, but gaining an insight that helps in the journey. Furthermore, it is suggesting that being a creator of any kind is neutralizing the ache of existing by simply making anything out of it. But hey, what can we point out as reasons for the world to be a living corpse? What evidence we have for this crushing feeling? Well, there is many, but mainly that we are the source of our own destruction and that of the others. And sadly, this is universal, for it has been proven true throughout history. Of this, the poem says the following in line 155. Open quote. We seem ambitious God's whole work to undo, of nothing he made us, and we strive to, to bring ourselves to nothing back, and we do what we can do, to do it so soon as he." End quote. If that does not draw any parallels to today, I don't know what will, being authors of our own destruction. Don't frame this as an act against God, which show which shows how misled is our existence, for it is an act against common sense. 
Having this written four centuries ago and having it still resonating with us despite all scientific discovery and technological developments is chilling. It almost sounds as a prophetic warning that with decay in mind is demonstrating us that it does get worse over time. This phrase we strive to bring ourselves to nothing back and we do it what we, and we do what we can to do it so soon as he might have been written in a newspaper which announces a hydrogen bomb test or the effectiveness of nerve gas. In a similar fashion, the lines following this previous one took us to today. With new diseases on ourselves we war, and with new physic a worse engine for end quote. Brings about the pandemic to mind, isn't it? And the violence between people and nations despite the current conditions. Or maybe the First World War and with the Spanish flu? Us, the maggots in this living corpse, are counterintuitive and pathetic, for we have realized this self-harm since forever. And yet, the condition does not change. Look at the new physics that paradoxically transforms the development into decay. No technology will free us from ourselves. For that technology is inherently us. But why are we like this? Why? Why are we like this? Well, that question four centuries ago and today is still in the melancholic heart. Now let's revise the other half. The harm we do to others. Of this, the speaker says the following in the line 200. Open quote. Both beasts and plants curse in the course of men. End quote. Again, absurdly familiar human behavior. It would seem like a stretch to draw the parallels to deforestation, GMO plants, and the global warming resulting from the inhuman industrialization of meat. But I'm sure that we could read this line written today in any media. That is because the central idea is abuse that comes from us and is destructive. These actions previously expressed are clear examples of it. Again, why are we like this? If we are so blessed with intelligence, why we cannot find solutions? No wonder why the dissatisfaction with the world. We are the curse of melancholy and destruction. About the inherent condition, the speaker says in line 237, open quote, Thou knowest how lame and crippled this world is, and learns thus much by our anatomy, that this world, general sickness, does not lie in any humor or certain part, but as thou sawest, it rotten at the heart. End quote. This is no sickness that could simply be cured or balanced, rather melancholy is inherent to existence. No black bile disbalance that we can fix. Rather, this world is inherently that humor, melancholic humor, melancholic at the rotten heart. No wonder why every time is the worst time to be alive. The 17th century and their melancholy have many hard truths that speak to us today. There is nothing like a complex conceit in a meditation to realize and feel the crushing reality. But this is what matters, what we gain out of this anatomy. While in this journey in which we understood the world a little bit more, we reach that neutrality Don was talking. Those images strike the mind and reveal a truth and feeling difficult to accept. It hit us to the face, but knowing is what we may gain from this anatomy, from this creation. The last lines seem to capture this feeling. Open quote. That song, because he knew they would let fall the law, the prophets, and the history, but keep the song still in their memory. Such an opinion in due measure, made me this great office boldly to invade. Nor could incomprehensiveness 
deter me from thus trying to imprison her, which when I saw that a strict grave could do, or saw not why verse might do so too. Verse had a middle nature. Heaven keeps souls, the grave keeps bodies. Verse the fame and rolls. End quote. The world is a living corpse, a ticking time bomb that will end with us. But while we are here, we may emulate God with our creation abilities. That will not last forever, but it will for the future, to serve to look at ourselves in truthful fashion. And though there is no hope for everything ending well, the verse keeps us alive in others. It is an extended life, no immortality, but close enough to matter to us living. Verse keeps us here, making each other's company. Thanks for listening. Good night.